Hello, church family. My name is Daryl Livingston. My name is Christy Livingston, and I'm going to be reading Matthew 9, 1 through 8. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, Get up, take your mat, and go home. Then the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God, he who had given such authority to man. This, this is, is the, the word, word of the, of the Lord. Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Daryl and Christy, thank you so much for reading the scripture today. We appreciate you doing that. So I want to let you know about a change that we've made. Uh, on Good Friday, April 2nd, we had uh, talked last week about the idea of having a drive through um, Stations of the Cross on Good Friday, and that was going to be a volunteer-heavy thing, and we were coming up short on volunteers. We realized that's probably something to try next year. So we are going to have a live, in-person, Good Friday service, 7 o'clock, April 2nd, here in this room. It will also be live-streamed. So just know about the change on Good Friday. We will have a Good Friday service, 7 o'clock, in the room and, uh, and live stream. And I just want to say uh, real quick, I'm so proud of our church. It dawned on me yesterday... Uh, Mary and I were, uh, had volunteered with Bed Start, helping deliver furniture to people who desperately, desperately need it. Uh, and at the same time, we had our mission kids who were distributing diapers. Remember donating diapers last month? They were distributing diapers. And, uh, and then we also had people helping with the helping friends and family food distribution with Community Lifeline. So we had three different groups serving around the town uh, yesterday morning. And so I was, just, I was just proud of our church at that moment and thinking how great that is that you have jumped in uh, to make a difference in the community. So, so thank you for doing that. So I have a, a scenario for you to imagine. Imagine you've uh, gone somewhere. Uh, let's say you're downtown Dallas, downtown Fort Worth, down, somewhere. You've gone and you've got to park in a lot and you have to pay to park in the lot. And so you get your parking space and you go over to the kiosk to pay. And when you get over there, there's someone at the kiosk trying to you know, make things work. And there's standing nearby is a, is a police officer. Well, okay, that's, okay, that's kind of odd. Okay, well, I'm just going to kind of stand here and watch. I'm not sure what's going to happen. And then you realize there's nothing wrong going on. And the person just has, seems to have trouble with the kiosk. And the police officer then looks at you and says, you know, they're just really having trouble with their card. Would you mind paying for their parking today? Okay, that's one scenario. Second scenario. You go somewhere, downtown Dallas or downtown Fort Worth or somewhere else, you have to park in a lot. You have to pay to park in a lot. So you get your parking place and you go over to the kiosk and the person, there's a person standing there trying to get the kiosk to work and they're having trouble and there's someone standing there next to them, but they're not in a uniform. They're dressed about like the way you're dressed. And that person says, you know, they're just really having trouble with their card. Would you mind paying for their parking today? Which one are you more likely to do? I mean, probably you had an internal reaction to that, right? So, of course, there's been a social experiment like this done, right? They've done this. And so you're basically twice as likely to pay for that parking if the police officer asks you than if it's someone who's just dressed like you are, just a you know, civilian in plain clothes. Because there's something about the uniform, right? There's something about a person in authority. It's that, that they've written stuff about this. It's called the authority principle. Do you know there are books, many books that have been written on uniforms? The history of uniforms, the purpose of uniforms, the, the ways that they, they uh, interact with people. So you, you, you have an idea that this person is an authority. They are in authority. They are, have a uniform, for goodness sake. Well, I should probably do what they say. I mean, when you go to a doctor, you kind of 
expect something similar, right? You, you go to see your doctor, you, you expect them to be dressed somehow professionally. Um, I mean, you know, a long time ago, the men, doc, male doctors always wore ties and the white lab coats, and uh, women doctors wore dresses, and it, it's, it's a little more casual these days, but at least scrubs, right? You want, you want something that looks like they are a medical professional. Uh, I mean, if, if they were in cut-off blue jean shorts and flip-flops, Right, I mean, right. I can hear the reactions out there. Ew. So you wouldn't, you'd go, I don't know if I want to trust that person. Because they don't look the part. They don't look like they are in authority. They don't, and if they don't look the part, they probably don't know what they're doing. Is the assumption we make. That's the connection we make. You see, being in authority is not the same thing as being an authority. Jesus addressed this with religious leaders uh, in Matthew 23. Um, I mean, pretty much that whole chapter, man, he kinda, he, he's really pointing out some things to them. And part of what he points out is, is to say that you've, you've taken great effort to make sure that externally everything looks the right way, all the way down to the ways that you, um, uh, the, way, the, the, the things that you carry with you that they look right, and that you are attired per- appropriately, and that the, I mean, everything externally. But he says, but internally you're corrupt. And he even likens them to whitewashed tombs. You might have been to a place before where there, the tomb is, is above ground, and so you can, you can clean those up, you can polish that marble, and it can look really nice, except inside. And he's comparing, he's saying, that's what you religious leaders are like. Well, so let's, let's talk for just a moment about why he would do that. What's, what's going on uh, in the background? Well, remember, uh, as we've, we've gone through the story now, uh, lots and lots of weeks, um, that, uh, you know, the Assyrians are gone, the Babylonians are gone. Now the Roman Empire has extended into this region. And so the Romans rule the area. And, and, and in the area that we would think of as Israel, the Holy Land, that they, they didn't like have this big military presence there because they knew of the, of the large Jewish community, and so they kind of had, had an agreement, so to speak. They had an understanding, at least, of the religious leaders, that the religious leaders would keep the peace. Now the Romans were bring in their, their military folks during big festivals like Passover, but otherwise it was pretty much up to the religious leaders to keep the peace. And among those religious leaders that were the most powerful were the Pharisees. The Pharisees were a group within Judaism. You know, in, in, in the Christian church we talk about how there are Baptists and Catholics and Methodists and Presbyterians, and all Christians, but just some differences, right? Well, the Pharisees were a group within Judaism, and they were very strict, very strict about how you observe the law. And they were the ones that Jesus generally had conflicts with. And so they are the ones where we see Jesus as Messiah confronting them. So let's see what's happening in chapter 9 in this Scripture passage that Daryl and Christy read. Uh, the parallel story to this is, is in Mark chapter 2, and, and I, I mention that just because that's often the one of this story that we think of, because that's when, uh, the way Mark tells it is that some friends were carrying this paralytic, this man who couldn't walk, couldn't take care of himself, to this place where Jesus was, except in that case, Jesus was in a house, and it was so crowded, they could not even get close. So they were able to somehow get up on the roof, and they knocked a hole in the roof and lowered their friend down to be with Jesus. Okay, and that's the way Mark tells it. And you know, there's always differences, little differences in the way the Gospels. So in Matthew, it's the occasion is Jesus has crossed across uh, the lake, and he steps out into his, the Capernaum area, and, and these guys carry their friend to, G- to Jesus. And Jesus, seeing his faith, seeing their faith too, <laughs> said, your sins are forgiven. Wait a second, how do you think they heard that in the moment? I mean, I, my, I wouldn't be surprised if the guy's going, Are you, look at me, I didn't come asking for forgiveness. <laughs> I need healing. Maybe the friends were like, what? No, 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 that's not what we, we're here for. What about the crowd? 
Well, Matthew loved, as he, as he writes uh, the encounters of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus, he loves to, to put together this contrast and this conflict of Jesus and the Pharisees. Because there were Pharisees there who were hearing what was going on. And so, so Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And what did they say? He is blaspheming. That is to speak against or to destroy something that is sacred. That was the charge against Jesus time and time again by the Pharisees. They were the determiners of all that was sacred, and when Jesus spoke against it, they would say, he's blaspheming. I mean, we see similar things in our world today, right? Somebody hears something they don't like, and well, that's... We label it right away. He's blaspheming. So Jesus then just says, he knows what they're thinking. He says, okay, so which is easier? Or which is more difficult, maybe? To say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, you are healed. Now, why would he say it? Why is he, why is he having this kind of exchange with them? You see, how is it that anybody would know whether their sins were given in the first century in Israel, or ancient Palestine, with Jewish leaders? It was the Jewish leaders who would tell you if your sins were forgiven. Because if you had done something wrong... They would say, well, then you have to make an appropriate offering. You have to make a sacrifice. You have to do these things. And when it could be verified, it could be uh, uh, shown that they had done those things, your sins are forgiven. Or is it easier to say you are healed? Now, Jesus wants to make the point that he has the authority to do both. He has the authority to to do both. So he tells, says to the man, so get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And the man does. <laughs> Jesus, he, he didn't have a uniform on. He didn't, you couldn't look at him and check all the boxes. Oh, he really, he is, really is a person in authority. No. But the crowds recognized it, right? They could, see the, they could see the religious leaders and know, okay, they're in authority. Jesus has authority. Jesus is an authority. Well, Matthew works real hard to help us understand the, the, this authority dynamic uh, in his gospel. So, there's, I'm going to hit some high, high points. So, in, in Matthew chapter 7, late, right at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it, it, it describes this. It says, Jesus, he, because he, Jesus, taught as one who had authority not as the teachers of the law. See, there's the contrast. Matthew 8. Now, this is a Roman centurion speaking. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. This one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Now, the occasion that he's doing this is he has a trusted servant who is very, very ill, and he is asking Jesus if he can heal him. And he expresses trust in Jesus with the same reasoning as what he lives with. I'm a person in authority, and if I say this needs to happen, it happens. I, so he's basically saying, I understand, Jesus, you're in authority. And if you say it needs to happen, it will happen. Someone outside the Jewish faith recognizes Jesus' authority. That's chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9 is what we're talking about right now, right? The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then Matthew chapter 10, Jesus calls his 12 disciples to him and gives them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. He sees authority not as a position in which I possess. It's not a, it's not a position, it's not a uniform I get to wear. It's a way of being with the power of God. And he extends that authority to his followers to do God's work. So, what about authority? I think one of the things you and I have to wrestle with is who or what is authoritative in our life? Who or what is authoritative? Why choose one news source and not another? Why, why read one book on uh, uh, the Bible, but I'll... Uh, no, I, I should read this one. I'm going to listen to Pastor so-and-so, but not Pastor so-and-so. I think that, I mean, you see what I'm saying? I mean, how do, how do we decide? What, what's authoritative? What is it that we decide, 
That's more authoritative than that. And friends, this is a pretty relevant question for us these days. Because there are a lot of conflicting voices, right? A lot of conflicting accounts about things. And so how do, what is it, what's our, what's our criteria to decide, to determine, I'm going to give authority to that one, not to that one. Because in the days of social media, man, I mean, right? I mean, anybody can say anything. And they do. And they do. And, and people see or hear something they don't particularly like, and it pretty, pretty quickly we can say fake news. Someone hears something that we, we, we disagree with, or we've heard somebody else say something different, I'm going to fact check you. Right? And so, okay, so you're going to fact check somebody. T- to whom do you turn to fact check? And why do you trust that source as opposed to another one? You're making a decision, this one is authoritative and this one is not. We make this decision hundreds of times every day and don't even think about it. So so what about people of faith? What about Christians? What's authoritative to us? I'll give you an example. I mean, is, is the Bible authoritative to us? Or is it that blog I read that says this about the Bible. Is the Bible authoritative, or is it because, well, you know, I watched Pastor so-and-so online, and he or she said that. Is this authoritative, or is it someone else that says something about it? Right? Does the church have any authority? Do we listen to the teachings of the church in a broad sense? Or do we look for the next podcast that comes out that seems interesting? We're deciding each time what has authority over me, each time. So the crazy thing is, is that we find in the Gospel of Matthew that this authority that identifies Jesus as Messiah is extended to us. At the very end of Matthew, you have that, this great scene where Jesus has, has completed his ministry. He's died on the cross. He, he rose from the grave. He's appeared to a lot of his followers, and now he's about to ascend into heaven. And he says these familiar words. Jesus came to them and, and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The risen Christ is saying, you've seen demonstrated the authority I have. And the very next thing he says is, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. All authority in heaven and on earth is is in Jesus. And he says, so, go, (laughs) go. And spread the news. You know, there was that time Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? That's still a relevant question. Who do you say that Jesus is? Well, Jesus gifts us with authority to accomplish God's purposes. Not, not our, my purpose. <laughs> not our purposes. Not our desires, our wishes, our uh, our biases or whatever it's to accomplish God's purposes. And that, that's, we understand that to be to love God and love neighbor. Because that's what Jesus said, not just what someone's YouTube channel says. Love God and love neighbor. Those that you disagree with, those that you see things differently, those that might have crazy ideas. But we can't just look the part. We can't just look the part of somebody who follows Jesus. We've got to be that person. Truly live and love like Jesus. Let's pray. God, we're grateful for for the authority that Jesus had in his day and time and the authority that Jesus has. That we know that We continue to worship and continue to believe that Jesus is alive. 
and that Jesus is made known to us in, in a variety of ways and through the power of the Holy Spirit, then we get to live the life that God calls us to, that Jesus gave an example for and calls us to live, that we can hear His voice, we can see the Word, and we can do it. So God, help us to be clear about the lines of authority in our lives, the ones that we trust, the ones that we look to. Help us to look to you for that authority. And we'll be careful to give you the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.